Hello, this is Francis Fish. Um, just so you know, it's me. Hi there. Um, this is one of my talks um, that I gave at um, a startup weekend I organised uh, with my wife Rosie um, probably a year ago now. Um, and um, I was very concerned that the people attending the weekend uh, would not find themselves creating organizations which were identical to the organizations they were already working for. Because um, I think most companies are pathologically wrong and have a pathologically bad way of uh, organizing things. So I wanted to just present some ideas which people may not have come across before. Um, because to me they were relatively new and I've been working in corporate UK for 30 odd years so I just thought I'd share these ideas with the, the participants um, at this um, startup weekend. Um, all of this stuff is actually um, discussed in much more detail in my book Unicorns in the Mist uh, which is available on Lean Pub. Uh, you can get um, um, subscribe to this book um, basically as I release more pieces for it and write more bits of it um, they will become available. I consider the book to be about 40% complete um, um, but I still have a lot of work to do um, to make it um, better and make it make it express my ideas a bit more clearly and yes that is a rhinoceros on the cover. The ideas I'm going to talk about are mostly credited to and came from the work of um, Edward W. Edwards Deming, uh, who was a, a statistician um, and mathematician um, who um, went to Japan just after the Second World War, and a lot of his, a lot of their success is credited to some to his ideas. But of course, the Japanese themselves um, were faced with very difficult problems, and they 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 took his ideas, but they still had to do something with them. So I, I don't really want I don't think one should belittle the effort they put in either. First, though, we have to talk about this thing. This is the normal distribution. Um, it's uh, basically what uh, affects us every day of our lives. Whenever we're doing something that's measurable, um, the, you, you have things that uh, will hit the center of the target, say you're throwing darts or whatever, and then a certain proportion will land either side of the target and, le and for the further away from the target, the lesser than there will be. It's, it's a mathematical th concept, but actually it's something you see every day. And in a company or an organisation that's doing or making something, as time passes, you take measurements. So the things could be calls, products sold, products made, sales, software delivered, all sorts of stuff. And you take measures of these things, and you actually look at um, their look at their performance. So, an example of a sort of machine that could create something that looks like a normal distribution is is this um, lovely gadget here, where you drop steel balls down from the centre, and um, the way these are organised, it generally they'll end up in the middle, but some of them will end up at the at the edges. So you end up with a normal distribution, and this 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 is just a way of demonstrating that a completely deterministic um, process can actually end up, you can still end up with, with, with variation like, uh, and this is a way of demonstrating, this machine is a way of demonstrating it. So what does random mean? Because people have started to use random to mean um, unknown or arbitrary. Uh, my children do this all the time and I tell them off and then they give me an oh dad look. So random doesn't mean there isn't a pattern uh, to the things you're looking at. And it doesn't mean you can't say things about it. But st statistics and the statistics of randomness mean you can only predict what may happen in the next trial. A trial is a posh way of saying a thing happening event. Um, and what this means is, is we can actually say things about systems as a whole, um, which we can't say about any one event inside that system. So you can you can look, say things about the shape of the system and the shape of the, what the system makes, creates, delivers, whatever, but you can't necessarily say that any one time you can guarantee that something will happen uh, the way you want it to, which is one of the reasons why 
um, this numerical targets nonsense that seems to so obsess the government is such nonsense because they're working with systems that have distributions of measurability of capability and um, you can't force those systems to change by just wishing that they will change. I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. So the topic of the time of, of the of the talk is it's not your fault. It's not your fault. There's there's randomness in there, and the randomness of of, of, of the systems you work with and and, and the tools and the, and, and the your own, your own understanding because you you you're also you also might go up and down have different moods different times for doing things. It affects your performance, and or you're always going to be doing your best. So, a little bit more about this distribution. Um, this has got some percentages of things that occur uh, inside the normal curve. So as you can see, um, roughly 95%, these are called zigmas, they're uh, distances from um, the mean, which is this mu at the middle. And basically 95% of everything occurs within these. And then you have a small percentage either side of it. Um, as an aside, the, the Six Sigma um, uh, concept, which some people have had to work with, uh, is about pushing, is, is about making sure that whatever you make, um, it, it's, it's, within, it's within the tolerance of what's usable uh, if it falls within six of these distances from the mean, which means there's a chance in several billion that it won't, it won't be fit for purpose. Um, more about Six Sigma in the book actually, I'm not going to go into any more detail about it now. So you're measuring something and the system itself has some randomness and 95% it, and of what's going on is just a product of the system at, the, at, the, at best. You know, it could even be 100% of it. So this is the point I just made. Got ninety five percent or thereabouts uh, of of the variability of the system is, is falls between these two two points. And as I say, these are just distances from the mean. The mean is and, and the mean isn't something you wish for. The mean is just um, a product of the system becoming stable. So um, you might, if this was defects or if this was numbers of calls handled per second or whatever, you might want that number to move in some direction or other. But you won't get it to move by wishing. You have to get it to move, uh, and you won't get it to move by shouting at people either. Um, because if the system's behaving stays in a stable manner, then the measurements you're making will fall within some distribution. And if the measurements are all over the place, you've got a problem that means you need to get your system stable first. So if you turn this, so what does all this mean? This is I've just explained this. Um, the point that Deming made in his book is that. 95% of the variability is down to the system that people are working with, whether it's tools or telephones or anything. Um, and maybe 5% is down to the individual. So anything you can do is swamped by the tools you're using and swamped by the um, things that surround you. So why would uh, some arbitrary target, you know, we want to increase sales by 6%. How can you do this when what the results that you, you, you're being measured on are, depend, are outside of your control? It's not your fault. And if people try to hold you to account for things that are not your fault, you have every right to tell them, it's not my fault, it's your fault. You own the system, you own the tools, you own the processes, I have to work with them. If you want better results, you have to make um, set things up in such a way that I, you can get those better results. Uh, and then I will do my job as normal and get you those better results because it's, it's controlled by uh, external factors. So it's all crap. Actually, that's, uh, I think my window's a little small here. There we go. Um, performance reviews, targets, performance related pay, annual reviews, it's all rubbish. If you, as the person who is subject to all this arbitrary nonsense, can't change the system you're working with, and you can only affect 5% of it, most of the time it will be swamped. 
So if somebody's trying to hold you to account for something that you can't be held accountable for, it's crap. And you don't need to feel guilty, you don't need to feel beaten up, and you don't need to feel upset. They need to take responsibility, because ultimately the system probably belongs to them. So we take our curve from before, well, we've made some measurements and we know what uh, the mean is and we know what our standard deviations are and we turn it on its side and then we create an arrow which is time usually because uh, we read left to right in the west it goes that way and this creates something called a control chart now what control charts let you do is actually um, see if the system is behaving the way you expect it to so in this case there's some arbitrary numbers around the side, um, the green line is the average, and we have the different levels of standard deviation uh, marked as values uh, using the dotted red lines. So basically, even though we have a, an extreme value here, it's still within the statistical norms. Um, this means it, 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 it's possibly an outlier, so maybe you would look into that one. But most of the time, if a system's reasonably well put together and it's stable and it's been stable for a while, stuff will wander around in here. But because of the confidence limits, you know, things will wander out. And you might even occasionally get the odd one that's that's outside of this confidence limit. It's only when you start to see them consistently falling outside, then you think, hang on a minute, something's happened. And then you need to go and investigate. But if you're in charge of a system, whether an example being a call center, for example, or, or, or a software system making something, um, and you know what this average is, and that average is, is some, for some reason not acceptable, um, then actually what you need to do um, is look at the system itself and work out you know, what is, 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 is causing this value and what you can do to change it. And you need to change the, the processes and the systems that people are using that generate that number and then you need to wait for it to become stable and see if the effect you've, you've caused is beneficial or not. So you need to be patient and you need to be grown up and you need to take and this is what taking responsibility is and this is what leadership is uh, in, in the terms that um, uh, W. Edwards Deming talked about Leadership is actually taking control of the system. It's owning up to the fact that it's it's your fault if things you know if you're in control of the system. It, it that that's where your responsibility is. It's not the responsibility of the people working for you. This is what you gave them to work with, and this is what they will give you. And they have no control beyond you know beyond doing a you know, um, uh, or they have very little control. This is what you've given them to work with. So it's not your fault if you're on the receiving end, but actually it is your fault if you're the person whose system it is. Um, uh, but this this gives you the, the tools you need to actually fix things and make them better, rather than putting arbitrary targets and other nonsense um, all over the place. Okay, so Deming's 14 points. Um, the 14 points have one aim, to make it possible for people to do work with joy and pride. Um, this is an excerpt from the book where I list the 14 points. Um, that I also go into some detail uh, about what they mean. I'm still writing this chapter as we sp as, as I speak to you. So this is so th these points are, are all are not just. Um, uh, admonitions, they're not just wishes, they've actually got some, some solid thinking behind them. Um, I'll talk a little bit about them now um, and probably spend a five, ten minutes or so talking about them. Constancy of purpose for me is one of the most interesting ones um, because we all think we know what we're doing and we all think we know why we're doing it, but if you work for a place where you have a, you've got to have uh, so many patients served, um, uh, nobody waits longer than five minutes, or some other stupid arbitrary measure. Um, that becomes a thing you concentrate on, but the purpose, perhaps, 
if you adopt a GP surgery, is absolutely nothing to do with that arbitrary numerical target. It's to do with serving patients. Um, but because you're being measured on the stupid arbitrary target, you find yourself in the ridiculous position of having to do things about it. So instead of looking for long-term improvements, instead of looking for things that work, you end up concentrating on, on stuff that's actually completely that, that's nonsense. Um, the problem is things that are easy to measure aren't usually the things that matter. Uh, Deming talks about um, numbers and he says, of course, I mean, he was a statistician and his methodology uh, uses numbers a lot. But um, the numbers that matter are what he calls the invisible numbers. Uh, the numbers that are actually hard to, 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 to measure, uh, the numbers that come from pieces of uh, of a company or an organisation interacting with each other. So, for example, the uh, purchasing departments made some, bought something very cheap, but the quality of that part is such that the people using it can't make a decent quality product. So actually the purchasing department failed, but they don't know that because they measured on the numbers. So, um, and adopting the new philosophy is what we're talking about now. Um, essentially, the idea um, that we um, need to take these things on board and, and, and care about them and actually start working through things like these 14 points and there's several other um, thinkers like Akov who have also have some useful and interesting ideas and use those ideas to um, help us get better um, uh, at what we do. Uh, now, cease dependence on inspection. This is an interesting one. Um, Deming was talking about the idea um, of people who are manufacturing because that was where he did most of his work. So inspection means you've built your car and then you have somebody crawl all over it and look for faults. Why did you build a car with faults? That's the question that Deming is asking when he says cease dependence on inspection. You should have been intervening uh, much earlier in the process and identifying where the problems come from. The other, now the next point, move towards a single supply for any one item. Again, this sounds like an industrial uh, requirement, but if you, um, like me, provide services on the internet and you have an internet provider and you have um, various cloud services you use, um, those people providing those services need to give you extremely good service and they need to be able to resolve problems very, very quickly because otherwise your business is knackered. So where is the point for you in saving a few quid a month if your company goes bust? Um, improve constantly forever and forever. This is an interesting one. Um, it sounds like one of those stupid posters you get, you know, there is no I in team, um, the whole, the whole, the whole Stalinist thing about the five year plan. And if you don't know what that is, um, go and look it up. Um, and it sounds, it sounds like it, it sounds really important, doesn't it? But he means improve the processes and procedures and the how uh, you do things and the why you do things. He doesn't mean um, exhort people to do better. He actually means improve the, the, the underlying system. Institute training on the job is about making sure that people are properly trained to do the job. Um, I've seen this in, in clerical roles where somebody turns up and they get given a desk and then just they get told to get on with it and everyone else is too busy to help them. And, and the induction course has just been about health and safety rules and nothing whatsoever uh, to do with actually the, uh, with the job. Um, I've seen this so many times. Uh, and obviously um, this is extremely important if you've employed somebody if it, in the software game, which is, which is the game I tend to talk about. So if you've got somebody who's relatively junior, they should be pairing up with more experienced people. There should be a process... Um, 
of code review to help them get better. If, if they're involved in, in, in design work, they need feedback. Um, and, it, they need to, and they also need to understand they're going to get feedback. Um, these are all incredibly important things, but people don't do them because it means they, they have to take their own eyes off the trivial day-to-day -day nonsense. But if you've got constancy of purpose, then actually making sure people are properly prepared is one of your jobs and a very, very important thing. Um, institute leadership is essentially taking responsibility for the system, doing this um, and, and actually not being afraid um, of being held accountable because um, it, if you can show that you're approaching problems in a rational manner and you're, you're using a scientific approach where you're trying things and you're seeing what the effects are and then evaluating whether those effects are good or bad uh, in, a, in a sensible and timely way, um, then people will trust you, uh, particularly if you involve everybody in the decision-making process. Um, I was, again, uh, in Deming's book, um, there's a section there where he talks about how ideas are handled and, and the, the big fear for the Americans in the 1980s, quite rightly, was the fact that the Japanese were, were pumping high-quality goods uh, into their um, economy and the Americans had no response. Um, and the Americans copied Japanese ideas, like, for example, the Quality Circle, which is where groups of people working in a particular area gather together and look at what's causing them problems, whether it's broken machines or uh, power or maybe the tools get too hot so we, so we need a different cooling system, all kinds of things. Um, but the person who makes the decisions, the, the person who, who decides what they're going to work on is not a boss, it's actually the people who work on it, it's the people who are close to it. And they can see what can and can't be done. In the West, in America, it was a boss because that was the boss's job to make those kinds of decisions. And this actually is, is the second point. This is point eight. You need to drive out fear. Um, fear is the fear of losing your job, the fear of, of being humiliated, the fear of being spoken to like a child, the fear of being um, effectively bullied. That is. That is where why people why places don't improve. Um, and to be honest, if you're working for somebody who works in that manner, get out. They deserve what they get, and why should you go down with them? This is another an interesting one because, of course, people like to to become people's comfort zone is the people they work with. It's, it's the department they work with, and um, a different um, talk, a different place to think about is, is this idea of flow of inside a process. So because we have tend to think analytically and we've broken our companies down into little analytical pieces, um, things like purchasing departments, buying inadequate tooling happen. Um, things like somebody penny pinching on your internet service happens. Um, somebody not having an alternative internet service in case the one you already use breaks. Those things happen. Whereas if everybody understands if, if it, what the other person needs uh, in, in the process of, 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 of delivering the service or product you make, then there shouldn't be any barriers. Uh, John Seddon talks about the flow being clean. So if you hand a job on to, to, or a task to someone else in another department, if the flow is clean, that person can just pick that job up and do it. So you need to work out what clean means, which means you need to talk to each other, and you need to break. You need to stop um, thinking of of everyone outside your group as the enemy. Um, this is an important one. This is really, really important, and I've already touched on it. Um, the 14 points are not slogans. They're a nuanced way of approaching companies that are failing and struggling. Shouting slogans at your workforce um, is, is, is just ridiculous. Um, I remember way back in the 1970s when I was uh, 17, 18, um, 
the head of the school I was at put these aspirational posters everywhere. Um, one of them was of birds flying. Uh, and the, slo the slogan was, they can because they think they can. No, no, they can because they're birds. That's why birds can fly because they're birds. She was sincere, but she didn't grasp the, uh, the, the actual, you know, the fact that she was making herself look very silly. And if you have a system that's behaving well and you have um, a series of measurements on a chart that you put up in the canteen, but you would rather those measurements were somewhere else, either more defects or higher productivity or whatever, and you just draw a line that says higher productivity, but you but the people working there can see that actually the measurements they're making sort of a following round a mean, they'll just think you're an idiot. And they'll be right. So sloganeering does not make things better. Sloganeering is what Stalin used to do. And we all know how beautifully uh, well the Soviet economy turned out to be being run. Um, management by objectives in this case uh, doesn't mean um, the objective of it describing your constancy of purpose. What it means is concentrating on trivial numbers, concentrating on the numbers you can measure. Again, the example of um, switching suppliers. It could be if you're making something that your workers are used to working with a raw material supplied by, you know, Alice. And somebody decides Bob is much cheaper and I'll make my I'll make better numbers. So I'll, I'll get the, the raw material from Bob. But Bob's raw material needs to be looked at and worked with in a slightly different way. And there's a cost involved in switching supplier, an internal cost, but it's one of the things you can't measure. So it's a hidden cost, and it, but it could easily be more than the cost of just sticking with the same supplier. Obviously, if you're being ripped off, that's a different kettle of fish. But if, the, if there's a trivial difference and it will require the people doing the job to make some adjustments, you, can't know, you don't know what that cost is, but it's very real. Similarly, um, arbitrary targets create a situation where people try and game the arbit arbitrary targets. Um, John Sedano, I'm going to mention later, talks about a place he was working with where essentially everyone had to be seen within a certain few minutes. So what happened was the uh, people organising that place, this is a, a government unemployment centre, the most vulnerable people in our society, they set it up so they would slam the door when they were at capacity for the number of people they could see that that day. Which meant, of course, the poor sods trying to get their money were turning up earlier and earlier and earlier. Um, which and then so then they said, okay, we'll open the doors and we'll and we'll only the first fifty can see somebody, and everyone else just has to drop the documentation off and leave. So they did all these things to gain the numbers instead of actually serving. The, the vulnerable people who needed those benefits um, and instead and, 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 and in fact because of all the rework it created an intense amount of loss so don't set people up so that they have numbers that they want to game or have to game in order to, to, to meet their targets just don't have targets it's ridiculous this is an important one all of the things I've been talking about in the previous section stop people wanting to put their name on the work they do. Um, I've worked on um, projects uh, as an IT professional which I would not put my name on because of the way they were managed and the way they were run. Um, there's a book called The Death Mar Pro March Project uh, and in fact The Death March Project is essentially when a project where everybody knows they're going to fail. Everybody knows they're going to fail because they're underspecified, they don't have enough contingency, or the contingency has been removed by some clever dick who thinks they can do it cheaper. And essentially, everyone's just striding off into the distance, um, yeah, at, you know, being paid to turn up and fail, which is wonderful, isn't it? Uh, so all of this, uh, driving out fear, making sure the systems are adequate, making sure people have been properly trained, all of this means that people can take some pride and they actually want to turn up to work. 
Um, it's, as, it's as simple as that. Um, this one sounds slightly patriarchal, perhaps, or, or, or whatever, but it, it's, about, it's about allowing people time to do projects and things that um, are important to them, uh, whether it's learning a foreign language or salsa classes or anything. Um, so, it, and, and I think in, in, in modern terms, it, it, it means that things like Google have a, uh, an idea where you can spend one day a week, or possibly an afternoon a week, uh, working on a project of your own, but you've, you're still on company time. Um, I think the company can use that project uh, if it so chooses. Um, but it just means that people, instead of being always narrowly focused, particularly if you've got a numbers culture or um, a culture that's that's got lots of slogans, it, it actually it helps get rid of that because people have time to think for themselves and they have and they have time to to practice their practice of solving problems but without the pressure and practice their practice of working together without the pressure. Um, so. It sounds like um, something that's really expensive and, and difficult, but actually the benefits are, are there to see. The other interesting thing is, of course, if you're in a, a down period in the economy and maybe you've got people spinning their wheels, um, well, why not? Uh, if you don't want to lose those people or if you don't want to, um, why not You know, offer them the chance to learn a language or something? It doesn't cost you much. It keeps them engaged, and it means when things pick up, um, they're still there. And point fourteen, point fourteen, which I've, I've said several times already. Once you've driven out fear, once you've allowed people to be part of the process instead of victims of the process, then it's everyone's job to keep it that way and to keep the process running. That's an extremely important point. And the other thing as well is there's a culture here, there's a, there's a flow here underneath, which is about continuous improvement. But this is genuinely continuous improvement. Is the thing we're doing today better than the one we did yesterday by some measure that actually bloody matters? Um, that's, that's an incredibly important thing. Because otherwise, it if you've actually st reached a stage where you can steadily pump out widgets of a, of a required quality, then actually maybe you need to automate that and get your people doing something that adds value. But that's a different, completely different conversation, I think. So, we were talking about the 14 points. Bob Marshall. Um, I met Bob um, when, <coughs> excuse me, I ran a conference uh, in Manchester. Let's see if I can get this to show him properly. Yeah. When I ran a conference in Manchester uh, called MagRails, uh, which was for Manchester Agra Mag Blech! Agile Rails, um, which is a Ruby on Rails and Agile uh, software development conference. Um, that's his t Twitter handle. He came up with a, a very interesting concept called the Marshall Model of Organizational Transformation. There's a, a model called the Dreyfus model, which is about skill acquisition for individuals, uh, which is discussed in the book, in my book. But Bob's, Bob's model is actually a model, a similar model, but for organizations. And it's also discussed in my book. Um, Bob says there's roughly four kinds of organization. Um, none of these, these figures are... Uh, Interesting. They're, they're, they're just they're, they're, nobody's actually measured this because it's a very hard thing to measure. Um, but the organisation types are basically. Um, let's see if I can get this to shrink a bit so I'll see it properly. There we go. Um, are ad hoc. You can read yourself. Analytic, synergistic, and chaotic. Now, ad hoc is basically when you have a small number of people in a room. Who are who are engaged in some kind of business, or, you know, selling golf bags. I don't know, um, and they don't need a process because they and they don't even need things to be particularly done the same over and over again. They just know each other well enough and know what they're doing well enough to get on with it and do it. 
Um, as this organisation matures and grows and gets a bit bigger, um, people need to start putting processes in place. So they take the, the, the analytical approach. Now, analysis in this context is about breaking things into pieces uh, and then assembling the pieces back together. So this is when you start to have a finance department, a training department, um, a human resources department, which is a term I personally absolutely loathe. Um, and these departments start to, to sort of do their own thing. And synergistic is where people work collaboratively and um, they understand each other's needs. Um, chaotic is actually where um, people take the, the synergistic view and they, they actually take complete responsibility for what they do um, and they work in teams and they, and they, and they, get, they just get things done. Um, chaotic is, is, is a, a word that D. Hock and his, his book about um, creating the visa organisation uh, coined and it was actually a, a combination of chaos and order. So it's basically literally that, that thing about riding the edge of the wave where the speed and the power are but also where you can fall off the wave quite easily. Um, the example Bob uses is, is of a, um, a ship that's sailing close to the wind where the most power is but you can fall off the wind or um, modern aircraft, um, sorry, modern jet fighters actually can't fly without being continuously readjusted by a computer. But the fact that they, they need to be readjusted by a computer makes them incredibly manoeuvrable. Um, so that's what chaotic is. Um, the, the blue lump is basically the proportion of organisations and it's also the amount of waste. Uh, waste in this sense of being unnecessary rework, meetings about nothing, and all the other you know evils of modern life. Um, this is the, the and this is the point. Um, an an organisation that's carrying an HR department, a purchasing department, all this other stuff, you're probably spending an awful lot of time just greasing the wheels. An organisation where people are working together well, you're spending less of it. An organisation where things happen because they need to happen without a lot of discussion, uh, because you're sailing so close to the wind, um, there's far less waste. But most of us work in these organisations. Uh, it's estimated that some between 40 and 60% of effort in most organizations of, of any size and I mean I mean 25 people I don't mean big corporations um, 25 you know 25 to 50 depending on the organization's culture is just spent on greasing the wheels to make the organization itself run before it does anything useful now what's waste in this context waste is anything that doesn't give um, your customer what they need doesn't directly add to whatever it is your customer needs to, to, to from you, um, and that that's a quite a scary statistic and quite an interesting um, point to make. But it's not your fault if you work in one of these organisations. Your the systems you're working with, the waste that comes from um, departments not connecting correctly, people not giving each other clean items when they move from one, you know, when the flow moves from one person to another. That is not your fault. Uh, and I think, I think that's a point that's, um, that really uh, needs to be made. Um, it, it, people need to really understand that. So, what's next? John Seddon um, is a, an interesting thinker. He's a British uh, guy. Uh, he owns a company or works with a company called Vanguard. Vanguard take Deming's ideas but apply them to service organisations. Um, this is a quote from John, a behaviour is a product of the system. If you want to change the behaviour, change the system, which is exactly what I was saying about creating goods of any quality. If you want higher quality, you must change the system that those people are working with that produces the quality you don't like. No amount of shouting makes any difference. Um, there's a link to a presentation of his here uh, from InfoQ. Uh, I'll 
about thinking, rethinking service organisations, which is well worth a watch. There's lots of um, stuff on Vimeo and on uh, YouTube uh, with John speaking. He's a very commanding, very funny speaker, but what he says is unfortunately true far too often. Sorry, I'm just trying to get this slide to... Yeah, you probably can't, won't be able to see that. If you manage costs, costs will go up. Uh, Seddon has this concept of failure demand. Essentially, um, if you do not serve your customer efficiently, uh, and efficiency again being a, serving their needs, um, effectively rather, serving their needs quickly, then they'll have to come back and come back and come back and come back and come back. Um, anyone who's used a call center will know this. And the point John's making is is you merge all your call centers together to one monster call center, uh, you manage the costs, which is just the interactions between um, it, the caller and, and the person in the call center. Um, instead of managing the need, the variety, the, the source of the problem, um, costs go up because essentially you it creates this demand for your services which you didn't have before because now you're not servicing people's needs. The other thing that John talks about of course is, is, is needing a clean flow so if you if somebody does need to hand something off to somebody else because they can't deal with it it needs to be handed off in a way that that person can pick it up and deal with it. Um, he talks about happy clappy tool heads uh, in particular one of the uh, things that he's very cynical about and has lots of anecdotal evidence about that it doesn't work is so-called lean. Um, the problem is lean is an absolutely wonderful idea um, and I have a lot of time for it but ideas from manufacturing have been taken and instead of people thinking about it they've just blindly attempted to apply them uh, to uh, service organizations and it doesn't work. You need to go uh, and actually look at the problems, look at the demand, look at where things come from and, and behave intelligently. And that means you need to go without any preconceptions and then you need to come up with a method which describes your company. All of this is actually straight out of um, Deming. So it's not your fault. It really isn't your fault. If you're given blunt tools, uh, if you're given, if you're shouted at and told what to do, uh, there's nothing you can do. So there's no point in getting worked up or upset. It's not your fault. Things always go wrong. Things always are outside what you want. So you need to work on the things that cause the variation, the 95%. Don't blame the people doing the job. Give them the tools and get out of the way. And watch John's video. It'll make you feel so much better if you work in one of these organizations. So, um, this is the book Unicorns in the Mist. Uh, you can get it on um, Lean Pub. Yeah, you can get the book on Lean Pub and um, there is the website for it. As you can see, the uh, URL is fairly easy to know. Um, book doesn't have a lot of readers. I don't mind. I'm here to engage with you as, as people are interested in the same things I am. Thanks for um, watching this video and I hope you found it some use.